Well, let's uh, talk about uh, probably the most interesting object I've heard about and also the most fun to pronounce. Oumuamua, yes. Oumuamua. Can you tell me the story of uh, this object and why it may be an important event in human history? And is it possibly a piece of alien technology? Right, so um, this is the first object that was spotted close to Earth from outside the solar system. And it was found in, on October 19th, 2017. And at that time, it was receding away from us. Uh, and at first, astronomers thought it must be a piece of rock, you know, just like all the asteroids and comets that we have seen from within the solar system. And it just came from another star. I should say that the actual discovery of this object was surprising to me because a decade earlier, I wrote the first paper together with Ed Turner and Amaya Mor Moro Martin that tried to predict whether the same telescope that was surveying the sky, pan stars from Hawaii, mm -hmm. would find anything from interstellar space given what we know about the solar system. So if you assume that other planetary systems have similar abundance of rocks and you just calculate, how many should be ejected into interstellar space? The conclusion is, no, uh, it, we shouldn't find anything with pan stars. To me, I apologize, it's probably revealing my stupidity, but it was surprising to me that so few interstellar objects from outside the solar system have ever been detected. Or no, none, no, none, nothing, nothing. none has yes. been, you, you do, we'll maybe talk about it, that there has been uh, uh, one or two rocks since then. Well, since then there was one uh, called the Borisov. It yeah. was discovered by an amateur Russian astronomer, yeah. uh, Gennady Borisov. Yeah. And uh, that one looked like a comet. Yeah. And uh, just like, a comet from within the solar system. But this is a really important point, sorry to interrupt it. Uh -huh. you, you showed that it's unlikely that a rock from another solar system would uh, arrive to ours. Right, and so the actual detection of this one was surprising by yes. itself yes. to me. Yes. Um, and, um, and But then, so at first they thought maybe it's a comet or an asteroid, but then it, look, it didn't look like anything we've seen before. Borisov did look like a, a yeah. comet, so people asked me afterwards and said, you know, doesn't it convince you that if Borisov looks like a comet, doesn't it convince you that Oumuamua is also natural? Yeah. And I said, you know, when I went on the first date with my wife, <laughs> uh, she looked special to me. Yes. And since then I met many women. Yes. That didn't change my They're opinion of my wife. So, I, you know, that's not an <laughs> argument. Anyway, so why did, <laughs> why uh, did the... Uh, Oumuamua look weird, yeah. let me explain. So first of all, astronomers monitored the amount of light, sunlight that it reflects. Yeah. And uh, it was tumbling, spinning every eight hours. And as it was spinning, the brightness that we saw from that direction, we couldn't resolve it because it's tiny. It's about a hundred meters, a few hundred feet, size of a football field. Mm -hmm. And um, we cannot, from Earth, we, with existing telescopes, we cannot resolve it. The only way to actually get a photograph of it is to send the camera close to it. And that was not possible at the time that uh, Oumuamua was discovered because it was already moving away from us faster than any rocket we can send. It's sort of like a guest that appeared for dinner. And then by the time we realize that it's weird, uh, the guest is already out the front door into the dark street. Yeah. Uh, what we would like, to find is an object like it approaching us because then you can send the camera irrespective of how fast it moves. And uh, if we were to find it in July, 2017, that would have been possible because it was approaching us at that time. Actually, I was visiting Mount Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii with my family for vacation at that time in July, 2017, but nobody knew uh, at the observatory that uh, Oumuamua is very close. That's sad to think about that we had the opportunity at that time yes. to send up a camera. But don't worry, I mean, it, there will be more. <laughs> there will be more because, I, you know, I, I operate by the Copernican principle, which says we don't live at a special place and we don't live at a special time. And that means, you know, if we surveyed the sky for a few years and we had sensitivity to this region between us and the sun, and we found this object with pan stars, you know, there should be many more that we will find in the future. 
with surveys that might be even better. Yes. Uh, and actually, in, a, in three years' time scale, there would be uh, the so-called LSST, that's a survey of the Vera Rubin Observatory, that would be much more sensitive and could potentially find an Oumuamua-like object every month. Yes. Okay, so wow. I'm just waiting for that. And the main reason for me to alert everyone yes. uh, to the unusual properties of Oumuamua is with the hope that next time around when we see something as unusual, yeah. we would take a photograph or we would get as much evidence as possible. Because science is based on evidence, not on prejudice. Yeah. And we will get back to that theme. So anyway, let me let me yes, point out some what of the is, properties actually. Yeah, yes. the, the elongated nature, all of those right. kinds of things. So uh, the light curve, the, the amount of light, sunlight that was reflected from it was changing over eight hours by a factor of 10. Meaning that the area of this object, even though we can't resolve it, the area on the sky that reflects sunlight was bigger by a factor of 10 mm -hmm. in some phases as it was tumbling around than in other phases. So even if you sure. take a piece of paper that is razor thin, you know, it's, there is a very small likelihood that it's exactly edge on. Uh, and getting a factor of 10 change in the area that you see on the sky mm -hmm. is huge. Yeah. It's much more than any, it means that the object has an unusual geometry. Uh, it's at least a factor of a few more than any of the comets or asteroids that we have seen before. You, you mentioned reflectivity, so it's not just the geometry, but the, the properties of the surface of that thing. Well, uh, or no. Or if you assume the reflectivity is the same, okay. then it's just geometry. If you assume the reflectivity may change, yes. then it could be a combination of the area that you see and the reflectivity because different directions may reflect differently. But the point is that it's very extreme. Yes. Uh, and the, it, actually the best fit to the light curve that we saw was of a flat object. Unlike all the cartoons that you have seen of a cigar shape, a flat object at the 90% confidence gives a better model for the way that the light varied. Uh, and uh, it's, so it's also like flat, meaning like a pancake. Like a pancake, yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, so that's the, you know, uh, the very first uh, unusual property. But to me, it was not unusual enough to think that it might be artificial. It was not significant enough. Then um, there was no cometary tail, you know, no dust no gas around the, this object. And the Spitzer Space Telescope really searched very deeply for carbon-based molecules. There was nothing. So it's definitely not a comet the way people expected it to be. Can, can you maybe briefly mention what uh, properties a comet that you're referring to usually has? Right. So a comet is a rock that has some water ice on the surface. So you can think of it as an icy rock Mm -hmm. uh, actually, comets were discovered a long time ago, but uh, the first model uh, that was uh, developed for, for them was by Fred uh, Whipple, who was at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the legend goes that he got the idea from walking through Harvard Square and seeing uh, <laughs> uh, during a winter day and yeah. seeing these icy rocks, you know. And so a comet is icy, and it's an icy on asteroid the asteroid is uh, it's not. just a rock. It's just a rock. Yeah. So when you have ice on the surface, when the rock gets close to the sun, the sunlight warms it up, mm -hmm. and the the ice sublimates, evaporates. Because mm -hmm. the one thing about ice, water ice, is it doesn't become liquid if you warm it up in vacuum, you know, without an external pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, it just goes straight into gas. And that's what you see as the tail of a comet. Wow. Uh, the only way to get liquid water is to have an atmosphere like on Earth that has an external pressure. Only then you get liquid. And that's why it's essential to have an atmosphere to a planet in order to have liquid water mm -hmm. and the chemistry of life. So if you look at Mars, Mars lost its atmosphere and therefore no liquid water on the surface anymore. I mean, there may have been early and that's what the Perseverance uh, uh, survey, you know, uh, the Perseverance mission will, will try to find out whether it had liquid water, whether there was life perhaps on it at the time, mm -hmm. but at some point it lost its atmosphere and then the liquid water was gone. So the only reason that we can live on Earth yeah. is because of the atmosphere. But a comet is in vacuum, pretty much, and um, 
when it gets warmed up on the surface, mm -hmm. the water becomes, the water ice becomes gas, and then you see this cometary tail behind it. In addition to water, there is uh, th there are all kinds of carbon-based molecules or dust that comes off the surface. And those are detectable. So yeah, it's easy to detect. It's very prominent. You see these cometary tails that look very prominent because they reflect sunlight mm -hmm. and you can see them. In fact, it's sometimes difficult to see the nucleus of the comet mm -hmm. because it's surrounded and shrouded with... And in this case, there was no trace of anything. That's fascinating. Now, you might say, okay, it's not a comet. So that's what the community said. Okay, it's not a... No problem. It's still a rock. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. not a comet, but it's just a rock. Yeah. Bare rock. Yes. Be you know, okay, no problem. Then... And that's the thing that convinced me to write about it. Mm -hmm. And then in June 2018, you know, significantly later, there was a report that in fact the object uh, uh, exhibited an excess push mm. in addition to the force of gravity. So the sun acts on it by gravity, but then there was an extra push on this object that was figured out from the orbit mm -hmm. that you can trace. And uh, the question was, what is this excess push? So for comets, you get the rocket effect. When you evaporate gas, you know, just like a jet engine mm -hmm. on an airplane, you throw, a jet engine is very simple. You throw the gas back and it pushes the airplane forward. Mm -hmm. That's all, that's how a jet. So in a case of a comet, you throw gas in the direction of the sun because it, and then you get a push. Okay, so in the case of comets, you can get a push, mm -hmm. but there was no cometary tail. So then people say, oh, wait a second, is it an asteroid? No, but it behaves like a comet, but it doesn't look like a comet. So what, it, well, forget about it, business as usual. So that's what they mean by a non-gravitational non -gravitation yes. acceleration. So yes. that's interesting. So like the, the primary force acting on something like a, just a rock, like an asteroid, would be like you can predict the trajectory based on the gravity, uh, based on gravity, and also here there's detected movement that's not cannot be accounted purely right. by the gravity. Of the and sun. if it was a comet, you would need about a tenth of the mass of this comet, the weight of this comet, to be evaporated in order to give it. And there was the, no sign of that. No sign. Uh, Ten percent of the mass evaporating. It's huge. Think about it. A hundred meter size object losing ten percent of its mass. You can't miss that. <laughs> and uh, so that's super weird. It's super weird. What is there a good explanation? Is yeah, there so, in so, your mind a possible explanation for this? You know, so I operated just like Sherlock Holmes in a way. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, what are the possibilities? And the only thing I could think, so I ruled out uh, everything else, and I I said it must be the sunlight reflected off it. Okay, so the sunlight reflects off the surface and gives it a push, just like you get a push on a w sail on a boat, you know, from the wind reflecting off it. Now, in order for this to be effective, it turns out the object needs to be extremely thin. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out it needs to be less than a millimeter thick. Mm -hmm. Nature does not produce such things. <laughs> so, but we produce it because it's called the technology of a light sail. So we are, for space exploration, we are exploring this technology because it, it has the benefit of not needing to carry the fuel with the spacecraft. So you don't have the fuel, you just have a, 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 you just have a sail and it's being pushed either by sunlight or by a laser beam mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, so perhaps this is a light sail. So this is actually the same technology with the, with the Starshot project. Yes. So, you that's know, people, fascinating. Okay, that's people cool. afterwards say, okay, you work <laughs> on this project, you yeah. imagine, the, you know, no, that's a pretty good explanation, right? <laughs> obviously, my imagination is limited by what I know. So <laughs> yes. I, you know, I would not deny that, you know, working on light sails expanded my ability to imagine this possibility. Yes. But let me offer another interesting anecdote. In September this year, 2020, I mean, yes. uh, uh, 2020, yes. um, there was another object found and it was given the name 2020 SO by the minor planet center you know this is a, an organization actually in cambridge massachusetts that gives names to objects astronomical objects found in the solar system and they gave it that name 2020 so because you know it looked like uh, an object in the solar system and uh, it moved in an orbit that is similar to the orbit of the earth mm -hmm. but not the same exactly and therefore it was bound to the sun but it also exhibited 
a deviation from what you expect based on gravity. Mm. So the astronomers that found it uh, extrapolated back in time and found that in 1966, it intercepted the Earth. And then they realized, they went to the history books and they realized, oh, there was a mission called Lunar Surveyor, Lunar Lander Surveyor 2, that uh, had a rocket booster. It was a failed mission, but uh, there was a rocket booster that was kicked into space. And presumably this is the rocket booster that we are seeing. <laughs> now, this rocket booster was sufficiently hollow and thin for us to recognize that it's pushed by sunlight. Mm. So here is my point. We can tell from the orbit of an object, obviously this object didn't have any cometary tail. It was artificially made. We know that it was made by us mm -hmm. and it did deviate from an orbit of a rock. Yes. So just by seeing something that doesn't have cometary tail and deviates from an orbit shaped by gravity, we can tell that it's artificial. Mm -hmm. In the case of Oumuamua, it couldn't have been sent by humans because it just passed near <laughs> us for a few months. We know exactly what we were doing at, those ta at that time. And also it was moving, moving faster than any object that we can launch. Yes. And so obviously it came from outside the solar system. And the question is who produced it? Now, I should say that you know when I walk on, on vacation on a beach, I often see natural objects like seashells that yes. are beautiful and I look at them and, um, and every now and then I stumble on a plastic bottle and the, that was artificially produced. And my point is that maybe Oumuamua was a message in a bottle. And uh, <laughs> we should sim this is simply another window into searching for artifacts from other civilizations. Where do you think it could have come from? And if it's, so, okay. From a scientific perspective, the narrow-minded view, as we'll probably talk about throughout, is you know you kind of want to stick to the things that uh to naturally originating objects like asteroids and comets okay that's the space of possible hypotheses and then if we expand beyond that you start to think okay these are artificially constructed like you just said it could be by humans it could be by uh by s whatever that means by some kind of extraterrestrial alien civilizations if if it's the alien civilization variety, what is this object then That's that an excellent we're looking question. at? An excellent question. And let me lay out, I mean, we don't have enough evidence to tell. If right. we had a photograph, perhaps we would have more information. But the there is one other peculiar fact about Oumuamua. Uh, well, other than it was very shiny I, that I didn't mention, uh, you know, we didn't detect any heat from it. And that implies that it's rather small and shiny. Uh, but the other peculiar fact is that it, was, it came from a very special frame of reference. So it's sort of like finding a car in a parking lot, in a public parking lot that, you know, you can't really tell where it came from. Uh, so there is this frame of reference where you average over the motions of all the stars in the neighborhood of the sun. So um, you find the so-called local standard of rest of the galaxy, and that's uh, a, a frame of reference that is obtained by averaging the random motions of all the stars, and the sun is moving relative to that frame at some speed. Uh, but this object was at rest in that frame, and only one in 500 stars is so much at rest in that frame. And that's why I was saying it's like a parking lot. It was parked there <laughs> yeah. and we bumped into it. So the relative speed between the solar system and this object is just because we are moving. Oh, uh, it was okay. sitting still. Now you ask yourself, why is it so unusual in that context? Yes. You know why? Because if it was expelled from another planetary system, most likely it will carry the speed of the host star mm -hmm. that it came from. Yes. Because it was, you know, the most loosely bound objects are in the periphery of the planetary system, and mm -hmm. they move very slowly relative to the star, and so they carry the when they are ripped apart from the planetary system. Most of the objects will have the residual motion of the star, roughly, right. relative to the local star. But this one was at rest in the local star. Now, one thing I can think of, if, if there is a grid of 
uh, road <laughs> posts, you know, like for navigation system, so that you can find your way uh, yeah. in the local frame, yeah. then that would be one possibility. So these are like little sensors of, that's fascinating to think about. So there, there could be, I mean, not necessarily literally a grid, but just uh, evenly in some definition of evenly spread out set of objects like these right. that are just out there. A lot of them. Another possibility is that uh, <laughs> these are relay stations, you know, that for communication. You might yes. think in order to communicate, you need a huge beacon, yeah. a very powerful beacon, but it's not true because even on Earth, you know, we have these relay stations, so you have a not so powerful beacon, so it can be heard only out to a limited distance, but then you relay the message, yes. and it could be one of those. Now, after it collided with this, uh, the solar system, of course, it got a kick, so it's just like a a billiard ball, you know, we mm -hmm. gave it a, a kick by colliding with, but most of them are not colliding with stars. And so that's one possibility, okay? Yeah. And there should be numerous, lots of them, if that's the case. Um, uh, the other possibility is that it's a probe, you know, that was sent uh, in the direction of the um, uh, habitable region around the sun to find out if there is life. Mm -hmm. Now, it takes tens of thousands of years for such a probe to traverse the solar system from the outer edge of the Oort cloud all the way to where we are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a long journey. So when it started the journey from the edge of the solar system to get to us now, you know, we were rather primitive back then. You know, we, we still didn't have any technology. There was no reason to visit. You know, there was grass around and so forth. Yeah. But, you know, maybe it is a probe. Uh, so you said 10,000 years, that's fast. So it takes that long. Tens of thousands, yes. T tens of thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the other thing I should say is, you know, it could be just a, a, an, an outer layer of something else, like, uh, right. you know, something that was ripped ap apart, like a, a surface of an instrument that was, and, and you can have lots of these pieces, you know, if something breaks, lots of these pieces spread out, like space junk, mm -hmm. and you know, that- It could be just, space junk from an extra from an alien civilization yes 